So let's have a lesson on this work by Satie. Um, as always, follow the lesson for free um, and pick up all the tips. But if you're interested, I do have a sheet music edition of this work, and there's a link for that underneath the video. So there's a lot of arrangements of this work out there. Um, some arrangements are very fancy. They have uh, right hand harmonics um, on some of the repeats. Um, they go into really high registers sometimes. Um, but I've kept my arrangement fairly simple. And, you know, part of this music, well, this music is very simple in itself, right? It's very melody based. Um, it's very calm. It just sways and it's very simplistic. It's not a lot of contrast. It's one mood from start to finish. From a historical perspective, this music is really a reaction to other music that was happening at the time. Instead of extreme um, um, serialism and, and that kind of content, Satie was going for this very just super um, beautiful melody-based pieces with just this one mood through the whole thing, just absolutely gorgeous. Um, so I've tried to keep my arrangement in that line. So to try not to fancy it up with other effects and things like that, but to just keep that flowing, um, flowing sound the entire time. So what I'll do is I'll talk about um, some ideas about the piece and how I went about making the arrangement. And then we'll do a walkthrough of the piece and talk about some of the specific parts and what you can do with those, those different parts. So I kept the piece in this key. Um, I think it's very helpful in this particular key. You have a lot of those open strings. Um, but I've eliminated some of the really big chords of more, the more complicated arrangements. And although it would be lovely to have some of those big chords, I find it very disruptive. And one of the reasons for that is that that opening phrase, You know, you kind of want the whole piece to sound like that. Um, like that easy and that flowing. When you start busying it up with lots of upper position work and tough chords and lots of changes where you have to let go of the melody to get a big chord, um, I think you really disrupt the flow of the work and it's already difficult enough on the guitar that I, I think making it more difficult just makes it um, difficult to accomplish the simplicity of the phrasing and the simplicity of the flowing work, right? So, um, and then there's a couple of other parts. I've tried to keep that melody, you know, it, up high as often as possible, but of course there's sometimes when the accompaniment goes a little higher. Um, the one de big debate that I had was at the end of the first ending at the end and at the end of the piece, where the melody goes to this G sharp on the third string, and then there's this cascading upward accompaniment. My real debate was I want to, to bring the melody up for as long as possible. So I did try to do just a first position. just simple chords and I still like that so if you're interested in that you just grab the same chords that I did except keep it simple here just maybe play an A and then a B minor chord B minor 7 chord and then an E major chord or do it in first position same thing at the end of the piece just do a simple first position chord but I did find that at that one spot I kind of wanted to expand the range of the guitar I found I found it was a little bit um, static sounding if I didn't go up the neck there so I did end up going just to have that rising um, figure in the accompaniment Besides that, um, I've just really kept the melody intact the whole time and tried to make sure that there's no um, disruptions to the octave of the melody. So before we do a walk through the piece though, um, I prefer playing the piece with a capo on the fourth fret. There's, that has nothing to do with the arrangement itself. Um, that capo is just there because I think it's, it makes a sweet spot in the guitar. It raises the pitch level of everything, which is really nice. Um, lightens it up a little bit, raises the pitch, 
and equalizes the sound of the open strings. So that's just like a personal preference thing. I did it just for um, purely because it hits a sweet spot for me in terms of sound. Try it on different frets if you like, or um, as I played it as well, without a capo. I think it sounds um, lovely without the capo. It's even a little bit easier with all these bar A chords. Uh, I think it's a little bit easier when you do it without the capo. So let's do a walkthrough of this work. So very soft, very static, just like waves, right? Bring the melody out. It's still soft, despite the phrasing and dynamic marks. Bring this third finger out. And don't lift your third finger. Keep your third finger sustaining, even if you can't hear it. So in the original, the melody is always above the accompaniment. Always. So um, it creates a real problem in the guitar edition because the accompaniment ends up on top of the melody a lot. So you just have to play that accompaniment really soft because you don't want anyone to confuse that accompaniment with melody, right? So you bring that note out, or even just before that, bring out the melody note. If you play it soft enough, it's obvious that it's accompanimental, and people won't confuse it with the melody. Bar 14. Soft. Inner note. So bring that D sharp out. Soft. If you don't play that soft, it's going to sound like a melody, right? soft despite the abrupt change of chord there right then make sure those are soft as well then the melody so I do a bar a on the second fret there that way I can just smoothly to the barre in the next on the next beat um, it's just a way of not having to jump into a barre because any sudden movements in this piece um, are really distracting because of the calm the ultra calm mood right so I use my third finger there that way all the chord notes are available immediately afterwards. So you can experiment with that. You could just switch the second finger over. It's a little bit hard to be legato and you want to be so legato in this piece. That's why I use the fingering. not ideal fingering on that second finger, second finger, first finger. The only way to get around this would be to do 4-3, and I've seen um, that in other editions. But that's a pretty tough stretch for most people, so I decided to finger it with 2. You just have to be really careful that you're ultra legato there and that you sustain that second finger for as long as possible until switching. But if you can reach it with the third finger, oh sorry, third finger, um, then go for it. I think it, it is a more legato solution. It's just, it's a little bit risky. Um, whenever I tried to do it, um, I can do it, but whenever I tried, you know, half the time I'd squeak and buzz a little bit and things like that because I just couldn't get close to the frets due to the, due to the stretch. So it's really your call, depending on your hand. I've got very small hands, so that's a tough one for me. So I went with second finger. Pivot into that note so you can keep holding on to this, right? Open strings. Pivot while holding that bass note, continuing to. 
This part here, some people are going to have a hard time with that particular stretch between the second and third finger. Um, this is in bar 38, right? If you do, um, you're going to have to let go of something, but I'd recommend that you try not to let go of the first finger because that's a melody note. In the original, this melody note would sustain for the whole bar, right? So we want to hold on to it as long as possible. That's why I did that stretch. So if you can do it, great. If you can't, you'll have to let go of something, but I recommend holding the melody at least. So that's not so bad in there. It's, it's kind of freaky at first, but it's pretty secure because that's easy. Stretch out, do the bar A, slide your fourth finger up, get the bar, You could roll these chords more, but um, I really try not to roll chords because I want that open, the feeling of the opening, just like, you know, just uh, very simple. So like I said, though, if you wanted to change it to just a first position chord, just grab an A, do a B minus seven. I still like that. That's very simple and a very, um, I, it almost suits the piece better, but I did go up just for some contrast in register. So then um, you go back and repeat and you go all the way to the second ending. So I'm just going to start from bar 40, the second ending. Don't be afraid of that dissonant chord. I know it sounds a little harsh at first, but um, just embrace it because then it makes so much sense with the chord that comes afterwards. So I do have to jump my second finger over there. There's nothing that I could find that I could do. Pivot out, but hold that bass note, right? You're pivoting to allow the open string, but you have to keep that bass note ringing there. It's very, the pivots are very important in this piece. Pivot, back to bar A, pivot. Now the, the last section here is a little bit easier because you don't have G sharp, you have G natural. So you can use the open string. I sneak the F sharp in there. Same chord. And the final chord is a minor chord. It's not a major chord, but it ends up being a minor chord. 